Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, we're going to take a look at Operation Battle Axe, Wavell vs. Rommel, 1941, designed by Michael Ranella, published by Revolution Games. First off, I do want to thank Revolution Games for providing me this review copy, and I want to thank Wes, a uh, viewer who kind of jogged my memory and reminded me and basically said, hey, I really want to, I want to see some videos on this game. Have you played this? You know, do you have this? And I was like, you know what? I do have it. It's on my to-go pile. And uh, so thank you, Wes. All right. So Operation Battle Axe. This is an area impulse game designed as a quick playing depiction of the June 1941 Allied offensive in the North African desert. The Allied player begins on the offensive while the German player is not allowed to activate either their 15th Panther Division, right here, or the 5th Light Division units uh, until certain conditions are met. Now, the Allies, like I said, start off in the offensive. Eventually, the tide of battle turns, and it's the Allies, hopefully for them, after they've taken some of these victory point locations, as you can see on the board, um, start digging in their heels, and they try to defend those areas, whereas the Germans, the Axis, it's actually Germans and Italians, technically, are going to be trying to take those places back. Um, now, I've already uploaded a tutorial playthrough for a real in-depth look at the game and you know, describing how to play it. So for this, I'm just going to do a quick overview here, uh, in my usual course, but then we'll cover my pros and cons, and then I'll wrap up with my final thoughts. So let's get to the overview. All right, so you can see I have the map set up here. This is the beginning setup. Um, the map play area is broken up into two different two different uh, types of areas. You have what are called areas here in the middle. So this is would be, you can see, kind of all mashed together. Um, Hellfire Pass, um, .206, Fort Capuzzo. If you know anything about this battle, about this operation, those uh, names should ring a bell. And they, may, they should ring a bell if you know a lot about the North African campaign in general. Um, and then outside here, you see these arrows leading to what are called zones. So these are obviously the areas that are farther away, encompass a larger area. Um, you're going to have fighting taking place, you know, primarily here in the middle in the regular areas. However, as you can see, you know, units can be in the zones and they will move through the zone. So you can have uh, fighting there as well. Um, also on the map, we have victory point locations. As I mentioned in my intro, the allies are going to be pushing in. You can see I have allied units set up here. They're going to be pushing in. They're going to be trying to take those locations, holding them through the ends of turns to gain victory points. Um, the actual um, areas that have the victory points here, they're only counted for the allies. So what's interesting, so as the allies are taking them, you're trying to hold them through your turns. You're only going to get the victory points at the end of the turn when the axis, if they push you back, or they push you out of those places, they don't get victory points, it doesn't subtract from your VPs, you're just trying to accrue victory points. So, as the allied player to win, you by the end of the three turns, and yes, the game is only three turns long, but it has multiple impulses, which I'll cover in a second. Um, at the end of the three turns, if you have at least 10 victory points, which victory points accrued from capturing the areas and controlling them with these nice control markers, or, or end, I should say, any... Um, eliminated German units will count for you as well. You get 10 or more VPs, you'll win. Any less than that, the Axis win. Um, for the units themselves, pretty common stuff. Um, looking at... Looking at a combat value on the left, a movement factor on the right. You can see what type of unit. You know, you have infantry, you have anti-tank or flak, and then you have armored... Um, the units themselves have a reduced side as well with a stripe on there. Very standard, you know, very simple, easy to read, easy to understand. As you can see, very easy to read them um, when my camera is focused in, of course. Um, we talked about the, I mentioned, excuse me, I mentioned the um, impulses and the turns, right? So there's only three turns in the game, but this is an area impulse combined with a sunset die roll mechanic for the, for the games, for the uh, action. So wh what does that mean? What that means is... Although there's a limited amount of turns, you see this impulse track goes from 1 to 12. Every impulse, each side will get to activate. First the allies, then the axis. You're taking your actions, and what you're doing in your actions, you're activating an area. So you're giving an impulse action, which would be something like maybe an assault impulse. So maybe you're activating all the units in the area to move into an adjacent area to engage in combat. Um, maybe you're doing a regroup, which allows you to move 
every unit as long as you're not entering any enemy territory or any contested areas that have enemy units, right? So kind of maybe maneuvering almost in the back, right? The background, um, maneuver your forces for eventual contact, eventual combat. Um, and there's a couple others. So you have those actions you're taking. Well, each impulse, you take your actions and then the impulse marker moves down. Once it gets to three, you start rolling, you start making what's called a sunset die roll. At the end of every turn, you roll 2d6. Once, and the impulse is going, I read allies, axis, allies, axis. Well, when you're rolling, all it takes, for instance, we got a six. Oh, it's at a five. That's okay. You're going to go ahead and we're going to move it up to the six, have another impulse. Six, six, still okay. But say we were we had just done impulse seven and we went made our sunset die roll. We rolled a six. That is less than the current impulse. That means it's sunset, right? The day is over. The turn is over. The turn ends. And that's how you're getting sort of the variable impulses every turn to turn. You don't know how many impulses you're going to get. You know, you're always going to get at least three of them, usually around the middle, right? Six, seven, eight, but you never know. Could be a lot more, could be less. That's kind of the chaos of the system of the, of the design. Um, the advantage marker is a big part as well. So you see there's an advantage marker here. It starts allied controlled. The other side is the axis. This allows you to do special actions. This allows you to change the result of a combat, say from a defeat to a stalemate. Um, it may be where the allies can force low fuel on the axis, which limits their operational capabilities, how many areas they can activate in a turn. Um, the axis may use it for, there is a basically a rommel action where for the rest of that impulse, all your attacks, Rommel will kind of be, you know, the man on the ground style. He's helping out so it improves your uh, combat ability. Um, it's just sort of a wild card, right? Now, once you use it though, it flips to the other, the other side, and then it just goes down the next impulse. So basically when you're using it, although it's going to help you, you're now giving it up and now the other side is going to be able to use it. Overall, um, I believe I've described the map, the units, you know, this battle was one where the allies are coming in, they're coming in, you can see that the units, again, this is the setup, coming in from the east here, the southeast, south, they're coming in into, um, you can see there's a border here, it has no effect on the game, but you have the borders for the areas, so there's also a light dotted line for Egypt and Libya, so they're coming in, you're in Egypt, moving into Libya, and as an axis, you're trying to hold them off. Eventually, about halfway through the game or so, or maybe after the first turn, these the fifth pans, excuse me, the fifth light division and the fifteenth panzer division will be released, and then they, you can see, they're pretty powerful, right? We're looking at armored divisions here, are going to push back on the allies and be pushing them back out of there. So the game is one where it starts off the allies on the offensive, and then about uh, a little bit, a third of the way in, halfway through, it kind of switches gears, and now the allies are on the defensive, just trying to hang on. Um, that simulates history, how the operation went, how the battle went. Historically, allies got penetrated quite a ways in, but were eventually pushed back and basically retreated completely out, out of there. All right, I think that covers everything in my overview. Again, for a more in-depth overview and to see the game played, um, basically through an entire game, at least until the game was uh, effectively decided, go ahead and check out my tutorial playthrough. And if I didn't mention it, I do, of course, have a recon video unboxing. Um, in addition to those. So, all right, let's get to my pros and cons. All right, time for my pros and cons. Cons first as usual. So first off, the rules that ship with the game, they're not perfect. Um, there are a number of questions I found myself asking and some clarifications needed. There's also some things that the designer, Michael Ronelli, obviously intended, but they weren't spelled out in the original rules, these rules that ship with the game. Um, an example is change to German retreat. So in the rules, right? So when you, you're learning it from the rulebook here, so you're reading the rules, learning it, a full strength German unit, one of the benefits of them and their capab capabilities kind of a, that the allies don't have is a full strength German unit can retreat to absorb one attrition point. No real restrictions. However, the designer changed it so that if said unit is in an Axis fortified area, which if you look on the map here, you have all the circled areas. You have, then you have these hexagon shapes. Those are extra fortified areas for the axis. Those are what I'm talking about. Um, if they're in that area, they cannot retreat while they're full strength. Another change or clarification, I guess, is the combined operations rule. So in the game, um, unless the axis are under fuel shortage, which the allies cause that to happen with the advantage marker, the axis can activate two areas during an impulse. 
in the regular rules, you could activate the same units twice, or at least it doesn't, it doesn't tell you you can't, right? It just says activate an area and it says you can activate one, see the results and then activate another one. Um, it doesn't really specify. However, in the updated rules, it specifically states the same units may not activate twice, which does make sense, but at least, you know, it, it's not in the original rule book. So it is something that to know that or to see that how the designer intends it to be played now, you're gonna have to go check that out. Um, there's also some changes that seems like they would affect the balance, um, such as increasing the effectiveness of allied air support in contested areas. Um, in the regular game, when you're in a contested battle, you roll for the, and you commit resources, which you, which you can commit artillery, or you can commit the allies have uh, air, air support. You roll a 1d6 and add it in normally. In a contested area, it's 1d6 and divide by 2, or it was according to the original rule book. Now, though, we change it to you roll 1d6 and you just subtract 1, and there's a minimum of 1. So, again, something that maybe seems like it would change the balance of the game, but there it is. Um, the designer, Michael Ronella, uh, he has uploaded an advanced rules, he calls it. It's, it's on Board Game Geek and it's on the Revolution Games website. You know, that despite its name, it's not just advanced rules, it's really the update to the overall rules. So... You'll find all the tweaks and changes, you know, everything that I've talked about and more. So although I appreciate him supporting his game after it was published, I know for me, when I'm trying to learn the rules from a rulebook that ships with the game, then I go online to, you know, maybe download new rules or kind of discover what's going on. And then I discover a new rulebook with like extra changes and tweaks to the game. It kind of confuses me. So I do suggest that, you know, if you're going to get this game, get the new rulebook right away, just so you avoid that confusion, avoid that problem of, kind of learning the learning the game based on these rules and then having to kind of relearn some things uh, afterwards. Second, um, you know, I'm going to talk about the balance a little bit later as well. I don't want to get into it too deep. I will say that um, the game seems to favor the allies. So with their large number of units um, to start the game and the power of the air support, helping them with, you know, all their attacks and every impulse they can use it which adds a 1d6, which I didn't go over combat, but combat is fairly simple. You select a lead unit, check their combat factor. Each additional unit adds a plus one, and then you'll have things like either the artillery or air support. Most combats are something like between eight to 14-ish um, combat factors on each side. Just depends, obviously, on what the combat is. Um, but I find that, you know, with the bonuses, with the way they have it, with all their units, for me, I found the allies winning game after game. Um, like I said, I'm not willing to say the game is unbalanced, mainly because I've only played it solitaire. And since this is technically a two player game, right? As I'm playing by myself, I may be missing a strategy that if I was playing against someone else who played maybe the Axis side, they would use it against me to stop me. So I'm curious what kind of the general feedback has been on the balance, but for me playing solo, it's hard to see Germans getting their share of wins despite historically defeating the Allied offensive and causing the sacking of British General Wavell. All right, on to my pros. With the game only being three turns, like I mentioned, um, and a variable number of impulses, it is a fast and furious game. Um, setup is easy, you know, thanks to the limited number of counters. And every counter, other than just a couple special ones, has, a, has the setup area or zone, oh, my apologies, in the top right. So B... That is zone B here. You can see it's named here. Or maybe one of this says six, Hellfire Pass, area six. So they're, everything's very easy to set up. And then with the limited number of them, it also doesn't take that long. You know, once you're comfortable with the rules, you can fly through your impulses. Because each impulse is basically going to be, you're making one sort of activation, impulse action, and then, you know, first the, first the allies, then the axis, then the impulse is done. Bam, bam, bam. You, you move through them pretty quick. Even when you're doing combats, it still moves pretty quick. And you're not going to have combat every impulse um, because it just, just, does, it just wouldn't work out. Um, during combat, lead units are usually um, reduced, as well as obviously any defensive units, depending on what happens in the battle. So units just start being reduced pretty quick. So you're not going to have enough full strength units to even engage in a bunch of combat. You know, eventually I found myself able to play a complete game of this in around an hour, you know, maybe an hour and a half. And then I was able to reset and jump right in and play again. In my opinion, that's rare for a more traditional war game like this. You know, one that has counters and area movement. But I think, I mean, it's definitely appreciated coming from me. Second, there are some fun bits of Chrome that combined with the design help to bring the history to life. You know, the difficulty of the allies taking Hellfire Pass. 
Um, the German panzer is being held in reserve until later in the battle. The Axis fortified areas that I talked about that give the Axis, you know, an advantage. Um, and it gives them advantage when it comes to their artillery as well. So when you're calling in support, you're calling in artillery, you actually make a roll to see if you even can because you may not be able to. It's one of those chaos things. With the Axis, they get a plus one on their roll whenever in those fortified areas. Um, low fuel, you know, hurting the Axis when the Allies um, basically use their advantage to for the low fuel on the Axis. You know, it hurts their operations because they don't have enough fuel supplies. It can only activate one area instead of two. You know, I could go on. The history really shines through with this game, and I have to give kudos to Mike Ronella for his design. All right, that wraps up my pros and cons. All right, on to my final thoughts. The game does have a high degree of randomness, you know, and in this gate, in this case, and for this game, it's both a strength and a weakness of the design, in my opinion. Looking at the weak parts or where it's a weakness, let's look at the combat. So when you're resolving combat, you're rolling 2d6. Um, so the results could be anywhere between 2 and 12. Most combats generally will be between forces that have anywhere from 8 to 12 attack value. Again, it does vary. But what you're looking at, for example, is that each area has a stacking limit of 4 for each side. So generally what happens is you'll have 4 moving into an area with 4, maybe less. You're adding up your values. Again, you look at the lead one. In this case, AT can't be a lead, but let's just say that he was here and he was a lead. So this armored is lead with five, one, two, three. Each additional only adds plus one, not for total combat. So five, six, seven, eight. Maybe use artillery. That adds an additional two. Say we're at 10. Okay, that's a very traditional number, right? A very common number in this game. Um, that means half a combat value. So going back to what I was saying, half a combat value is the dice, right? 2d6, right? 2 to 12. This is 10. Well, if half the combat value is the dice, that adds a lot of randomness. Sometimes it was hard to plan out exactly how a battle would go. Even not exactly, we'd even have a really good idea. Because so many of the battles were really close in strength. Now, as a strength of the randomness of the game, I love the impulse system. You know, when you combine that with the sunset die roll, you know, you're never knowing exactly how many actions each side is going to get before a turn ends. It's very random, you know, rolling the sunset die roll to see when the turn ends, but it just works. It brings the chaos and uncertainty into the game you know, that can ruin even your best laid plans. There's plenty of times where I was like, oh, I got plenty of time this turn to do something. Maybe I was thinking the allies had this plan, this plan, and the turn ended before before I got the chance to finish out all my actions. So it, that helps, I think, for the game itself, the game design and simulating the history, but I also think that it helps as a solitaire game. All right. Now, I do question its long-term replayability. So it has a smaller map, right, with fewer counters, you know the VP locations. Um, you know the game always starts with the allies, you know, right here. And they're on the offensive, pushing in with the allies on the defensive. Then a turn later or so, the tide shifts as the Axis gain, ac ac excuse me, the Axis gain access, say that three times fast, to their two frozen armor divisions. And now the allies have to hang on. Once you play the game a half dozen times or so, like I just did over the last few days, you know, you start seeing some of the same situations pop up again and again. Now, the designer, he did include some optional rules to spice the game up, throw some variety into it. Um, so once you know, once you play the regular game enough to feel comfortable, you can add those in, which does help. As a solitaire game, I really enjoy this one. The area impulse game mechanic combined with the sunset die roll lends itself very well to solo, solo play. I think of it like chip pull. You know, with chip pull, you don't know who you're going to get to activate, right? You're, you're pulling a chit, which formation or unit or units are going to activate. In this game... You don't know when the activations will end or how many you will get to do. I do love that chaos factor when playing this game solo. Overall, another excellent design from Marco, Michael Ranella, a man who has seemingly mastered the creation of historically accurate and fun area impulse style war games. Hope you guys enjoyed this review. Um, hope you enjoyed my other videos on the game. Please let me know if you did. Let me know if you played this one. And uh, I look forward to your feedback on those videos, on this video. And let me know what game I should check out next. So, And of course, if you're not subscribed, you know, you haven't given this video a like, please do so, especially your subscription. Really helps me to get more games to show off to you guys. So, all right, I think we'll end it there. Until next time, everyone. Later.